Well, good morning, New Song. Okay, well, let's do that again. Good morning, New Song. Good morning. <laughs> hey, welcome to all those who are joining us online this morning, and uh, a special welcome to all of our guests. Come on, church, let's welcome everyone this morning. Well, hey, I got a couple things I want to mention before I jump into the message. And uh, the first one is, uh, so some of you know that, you know, my son Kelvin uh, is getting married in January, and, and uh, he's actually going to be moving to Plymouth uh, this weekend. And uh, so if you, if you see Sherry not being Sherry this week or month or even half a year, it's because she's losing her, not losing, but her firstborn is leaving uh, the, the nest. And so, but that's not what I want to say. I, I want to say this, that uh, I can let the cat out of the bag now because it was just announced this morning in Plymouth that Pastor Josh, uh, the, uh, the youth pastor there that took over for me, uh, who's been there now, I think for what, six years, something like that, eight years. Uh, he is actually transitioning. He is he resigned a couple of weeks ago. He's moving to Florida. I mean, why, right? Florida. Um, and uh, anyway, he's moving. That's actually where he's from. So he's going back home to Florida, and he's going to be on staff at a church that he will eventually take over. Um, and uh, so he's moving to Fort Lauderdale, or not, excuse me, Fort Myer, Florida. And um, so anyway, today, uh, so all of you know that a couple weeks ago or a few months ago, however long it's been now, I said that Kelvin was going to go there and intern, and he did, but there was a little bit more to the story that I couldn't share at that time. The idea was that he was going to take over, and today he was announced as the new youth factor in Plymouth. So he is going to be the new youth factor in Plymouth. And so, which is kind of cool that that's where me and Sherry started the youth ministry at, and our son is now taking it over, and he's just kind of keeping the legacy. And, and uh, there's nothing better than when you're when when you see your kids, act, you know, following after the heart of God, but also doing what you have done uh, before. And uh, so we're excited for him. Uh, uh, we we listened to the actual thing on the way here, and and so uh, Sherry, you know, uh, you know, just a little teary eyes. And uh, so if you see her today, I did not make her mad, okay? Just, just putting that out there. So if you see a tear in her eye, it ain't because of me, okay? I've done that enough, but not today. So uh, uh, anyway, and the second one thing is, so anyway, if you see Calvin or if you have him on Facebook or whatever, just congratulate him, send him a message. If you have a text, Sierra, him, either both, just send them, hey, congratulations. So now the cat's out of the bag and we could be more free with it. Uh, and, and things like that. And so um, we're actually, he, he's going to be uh, uh, handed the baton, the baton next Sunday night at, uh, at the youth ministry, and me and Sherry are going to head that way and, and uh, go see him, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to it. So anyway, that's what's going on with Kelvin, and uh, he's moving, again, he's moving this weekend to Plymouth, and uh, uh, Kendall is sad that her brother's leaving, but she's happy that she gets his room. So uh, I said, you're ready to kick that boy out. <laughs> so anyway, and the other, the second thing is, is, is next week we're going to take up our offering to pay uh, utility bills for people in Wabash, and, and we're calling it Keep Wabash uh, Lit. And, um, and, and so what we want to do is next Sunday we're going to take up a special offering. So I, I, I got to say this. First of all, the offering we take up is not your tithe, okay? It's an offering. It's different. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take up one offering, that's going to be for the tithe, and then we're going to take up a second offering, which is going to be the offering for the utility bills. If you give online and you give that, if you give that, uh, whatever you're going to give toward the uh, electric bill online, uh, I still need you to write it on the envelope of what you're giving so they can count it, so I can know, so we can celebrate together. Our goal is $5,000. I believe that we will we will surpass that. Me and Sherry already have uh, our number and ready to give it. And, uh, and, and, and when I say this, I mean this with all my heart. We are giving by faith. We're not giving out a surplus. We're giving out faith, okay? So I'm asking you, as a church, let's, let's bless our community and give out of faith. And uh, I was reading the other day the story, and it popped out at me. Um, 
And it's about when Jesus fed the 5,000, uh, it says when the, uh, let me go back. Late in the afternoon, the, the 12 came to him and said, send uh, the crowd away so they could go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. And here's what Jesus said, and, and this is what stuck out to me, and I want to say this to us. Jesus said this, you give them something to eat. I, I want you to notice something. I, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this, okay? Listen to me. There is a miracle in your house. There is a provision in your house that if you just give it to God, he will create a miracle. What did he say? You feed them. You take what you have and you place it in my hands and I will bless it. Sometimes we just sit around and we ask God to do everything. God, you do it, you do it, you do it, you do it. And God is saying, I want you to do something and then I'll do the rest. I want you to do your part, and then I'll, I'll do the rest. So what did he say? He, he said, you give them something. And they answered as we all would. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish unless we go and buy food for all the crowd, about 5,000. And that was just men were there. But here's what Jesus said. But he said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups about 50 each. And then we, if you know the story, Jesus blessed it. He gave it out, and they had so much left. They had so much food, they were satisfied, and they had left over. And so here's what I'm going to say. Some of you, everyone in this room next week, we have something to give. Everyone has something to give. Some people have a whole lot to give. But we're all going to give, and we're going to put it in the hands of Jesus, and we're going to watch him do a creative miracle with it. Amen? Amen. All right, so go ahead and grab out and take out your message notes, and uh, we're going to jump in to our message. So today I'm going to start in a new series called One Hit Wonders. How many of you remember those One Hit Wonders growing up? Like you heard those songs, and you're like, man, it's a great song, but you have no idea who sang it. Because the artist doesn't matter, the song does, right? So what I'm going to do is, you're going to see the, the, the lyrics of a song pop up that were really popular, and I know I'm going to be dating myself, okay? I know, I know. Uh, speaking of, somebody turned 45 on Tuesday. I'm not telling, I'm not saying who, but uh, somebody turned 45, so I'm getting, Kendall already calling me Papa. So anyway, um, <laughs> so anyway, um, so I'm going to, we're going to put some, um, um, uh, yeah, names on the screen. You're going to recognize the name, but I want you to tell me who's sung it. You ready? Here's the first one. Anybody remember that? Hey, Mickey, you're so fine. You're so fine. You Go ahead, go. I want to know how the 20-something-year-old just outdid all of y'all. Like, how did the 20-something-year-old know what that song sang? Said. Uh, anyway, it don't matter. Who knows who sang it? Some of you do. All right. Well, one, John, or two people. Two people know who sang that song. And uh, it is actually by a girl named Tony Basil, uh, spelled with an I, by the way. Uh, not a Y, because there's a difference. Somebody spelled my name with an I the other day, and I'm like, uh, yeah, no, wrong one. Uh, so anyway, this song came out in 1981. And anyway, my brother's name was Ricky. So we flipped it. A Ricky flipped it, and it was, Ricky, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind. Hey, Ricky, see? He loved that song. Like, he probably still listens to it while he's driving down the street. <laughs> All right, next one. Y'all know that one? Who let the dog? Man, I wish I could sing. Like, I, I could break it down up here, but I'm not going to because y'all would leave. Um, anybody remember who sang it? Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Close, Baja men, the Baja men, who let the dog out? That thing became a world hit. Like, there were stuffed animals, and I mean, it just became something, right? Now, this one I, I, I did like, okay? So, don't, don't hate me. Don't hate on me, okay? But I did like this guy, and I liked this song, and I actually saw his movie that is absolutely cheesy, so don't watch it. But anyway, here it is, this guy right here. Anybody remember him? <laughs> yeah! Ice, ice, baby. Da, na, 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 na. <laughs> Anybody seen this movie, Cool Guy? Good, don't. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, he's got a line in there that, okay, I got to say it. He's got a line in there that says he, he likes this girl and she's with another dude, though, and he's like, hey, yo, yo, drop the zero and get with the hero. I'm like, I'm going to use that. <laughs> I never did. I never did. Can I use that on you? Is that how I got you? No? Okay. <laughs> all right. Here, I got two more. Here's one. We all know this one. Don't worry. Yeah, no, not, okay, whatever. Anybody remember who sang it? Oh, there you go. Wow. Good job. All right. Here's the last one. Everybody knows the song. I guarantee it. Well, maybe not everyone, not if you're under like five, maybe not. But everybody else has heard of this song. You ready? This one. Now, I'm not a betting man, but if I was going to bet, I would say everybody knows who sang this song. Who sang it? <laughs> mullet man himself. That's who sang it. The guy still has a mullet, okay? I mean, he's bringing it back. But achy, breaky heart. Anybody know this lyric? <laughs> Y'all didn't know you were coming to karaoke at New Kong, did you? Uh, anyway, these were all popular songs back in the day. And, but here's what I know. You guys don't really remember who sang them because the artist sang that song and went away. Now, Billy Ray's still around, but he's more around for other things because his daughter's a little famous, you know, and, and, <laughs> and he still has the mullet. So uh, uh, anyway, it's a joke. I had a mullet growing up, so I'm not hating on the mullet, okay? So. Um, but anyway, these were all popular back in the day. And, and uh, so in this series, what I want to do is I want to look at three books in the Bible that only have one chapter, just one chapter. But in the, that one chapter, pretty powerful, uh, pretty powerful things that God wants to teach us. And, and one of the, the first book we're going to look at and today, we're going to look at a book called Philemon. Everyone say Philemon. I'm going to be honest. You ready? I did not know how to pronounce that word until I studied for this. So I've known this word now for a week. You're welcome. You know what I used to call it? Philemon. 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 Okay, that's what it is, Philemon. And now, I'm going to be honest too, I've never read this book. I skimmed right through it as I was going to Hebrew or Revelation, you know, one or the other book. Um, and, and so I, now, I mean, I take it back. I did have to read it in Bible college, but I didn't really read it, if you know what I mean. And, and so, uh, <laughs> some of y'all will get that later. So I, um, I, I never really looked at this book, never really thought about it. And, and you, you might read it today and go, well, this has nothing to do with me until you have to ask yourself, has anyone ever wronged you? Has any, anybody ever done something to you that you felt wronged, that you felt offended, that you felt like, you know what, I can't believe you did that to me. I'm going to get you back. And that's what uh, Paul is writing to. So Philemon is an actual person in, in the Bible, and he was a, he, he was a wealthy uh, man. He was a Christian. And, and so he had this slave, and his name was Onesimus. Everyone say Onesimus. Because I just learned how to say that this week, too. I studied hard, church. I'm just saying. Because you know what I used to call him? One of us. <laughs> Listen, I can fake it until I make it up here, okay? So one of us, and most of y'all would not know if I was wrong. I could be like, yeah, one of us said this, one of us. Y'all like, yeah, yeah. And it's wrong, okay? Onesimus. Onesimus. So I asked Sherry yesterday how to say that. She got it wrong, too, so we both felt good together. Kelvin got it right. I said, get out of here. Get out of my car. Just get out of here. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he probably just read this book to, to get a degree. So he probably did. Yeah, I know it, Dad. But uh, anyway, so the point is this. The point is this. Most of us have never read this book, but most of us have all dealt with things that are happening in this book. We've all been wronged. We've all had people wrong us or been offended. And so my question is, to you, though, is how do you handle when people wrong you? 
How do you handle it when people wrong you? How do you handle it when people offend you? And look at if you've never been offended, you haven't lived long enough. And, you know, and, 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 and so if, if no one's ever wronged you, then maybe it's because you're the one that's wronged everyone else. Maybe you're the wrong person. I don't know. Uh, but Paul wrote this letter to the Philemon because Philemon had been wronged by a, gang, a guy named Onesimus. And so Onesimus was a runaway slave, and we don't know why he ran away, but there's a re- there's reason to believe that he stole from his master and ran away. So he ran to Rome where Paul was in prison, and apparently he met Paul while he was in prison, and Paul led him to the Lord. And so that's the background of the book. That's the background of the story. It's all, look at me, Philemon is all about reconciliation. That's what it's about. And here's what I got to say. If there are going to be times in our life that we need to reconcile with other people. We just don't know how. But, but I, and, and so I'm going to get into some things and, because I know some of you right now are like, oh, but I can't reconcile with that person. Well, I'm going to teach you some things. If we can hear the thing, reconciliation takes two, not one. There's two people to reconciliation. If one isn't willing to reconcile, then, but the other two steps that I'm going to talk about apply to all of us. So anyway, here we go. I'm going to say it. Here we go. Philemon, no, Philemon, 1, 8 through 11. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you from my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. So Paul, went on, in the beginning of the verse, Paul was bragging on Philemon. Told him how great his faith was, and he, he was so encouraged that he prayed for him, and and and, and all of just like building them up, building them up, building them up, and then finally he comes in and goes, "Hey, Philemon, I have a favor to ask of you." And he was like, "You know what? I, I because I'm Paul and I'm an apostle, I have apostolic authority. I could command you to do what I'm about to ask. I don't want to command you. I want you to do it out of your own love. I want you to take the guy back." that took off, stole from you and took off running, who wronged you. Philemon, I need you to open your heart to Onesimus. And, and I can point you to think about it. Put yourself in Philemon's shoes right now, and you hear somebody go, hey, I want you to think about the worst person that's ever offended you or wronged you. I want you to hear this. Paul comes up to you and says, hey, I love how much you love Jesus. Now I need you to love the person that wronged you too. That's hard. Y'all ain't, y'all ain't agreeing too much because you know it's hard. Like, that's hard. It's hard to love people that don't love you. It's hard to forgive people that don't, aren't asking for it. It's hard to reconcile with people. But I don't know about you. I don't know if you know this, but this book is full of people that have been reconciled to Jesus. And look, at this room is full of people that have been reconciled to Jesus. And so here you have Philemon, he, I mean, uh, you have Paul going, hey, Philemon, there's this guy that you know, that me and you know very well. As a matter of fact, I now consider him a son. And I need you, I need you, Philemon, to bring him, allow him to come back. Paul was like, I know what he's done. Now listen to me, I, I need you to hear this. In no way is Paul saying what uh, Onesimus done was, was not good, was wrong, or No. He wasn't, he wasn't downplaying it, right? So Paul isn't like, oh, just get over it. It's no big deal. It's, it's none of that. He, he wasn't saying that. Paul knew exactly what Onesimus did. He, he knew all about it. But here's what Paul was saying. Before Jesus, Onesimus was useless. Now with Jesus, he's useful. Now, here's a play on words because Onesimus in the Greek word means useful. His, his literal name means useful. And so here you have Onesimus, and he's a slave, and he's running away from uh, Philemon, and, and he's running away, and he meets Paul, and he meets Jesus, and now Paul goes, man, your life has changed. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever met someone whose life has been changed? 
Like they were one way, and now you look at them and go, man, there's just something different about you. That's Jesus, everybody. That's what Jesus does to us. That's what Jesus does in us. He changes us from the inside out. But can I say this? There are times in our lives that, yes, we're forgiven, but there are times when we have to reconcile the things that we've done. I'll say it like this. Jesus forgives us of our sin, but he doesn't always take away the consequences of our sin. So here you have Paul going, Paul, I mean, oh, oh, oh Nestle, I need to send you back. I need to send you back because you're a fugitive. You are a runaway. I need to send you back. It would be like a guy who broke out of prison and got saved. Well, he's still, he's still a convict. He's still a runaway prisoner. He's still got to go back, right? And that, that's what Paul is trying to tell uh, Onesimus. I, you need to go back. And here's the, here's the powerful thing. Onesimus was willing to go back. He could have gone, oh, okay, Paul, I'm going to go back. And then he still kept running. But something inside of him changed. And, 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 and if you're a believer, something inside of you at one time changed. Here, here's what I, I wrote this down. God cares more about who we are becoming than who we once were. God cares more about who you're becoming than who you once were. God cares more about your progression than where you were a year ago. As long as you're moving, God cares about that. God cares about who you are becoming, not who you were. And so Paul's going to uh, teach Philemon and us uh, how to reconcile with someone who has wronged us. So jot this first one down if you're taking notes. Number one, be open to reconciliation. Be open to it. Be open to reconciliation. Philemon 12, 14 says, I am sending him. I want you to hear the description of this. I am sending him who is my very heart. What was he saying? I am sending myself. I am sending everything to you. But, uh, uh, and, and I want you to receive him back. I would have liked, here's what Paul said, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do, excuse me, any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Paul, Paul again, Paul isn't saying what, what he did wasn't a big deal. But what was, what was Paul asking? Paul was asking him to open his heart. Paul was saying, hey, hey, Philemon, I just need you to open your heart to the idea of being reconciled back to Onesimus, because Onesimus was willing to be reconciled. Onesimus was willing to go back to Philemon and be reconciled to him and pay for whatever he had taken. Here's the question I have for you. When you have been wrong, what do you do? You know what most of us do? We delete the person out of our life. I'll use a Facebook term. We, we block them. We just, have you ever blocked somebody? I have. A whole lot of peace came when I hit that block button too. <laughs> but then there are times I had to unblock them because I was ready to move on, move forward. And, and so most, a lot of us will delete people out of our lives, we'll block them out of our lives, and we want nothing to do with them anymore. But what happens when that person that who, who wronged us has an encounter with Jesus and they want to come back to us and reconcile with us? What's your response? And I know, look at the card. I'm not saying it's easy. It's hard. Because I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know what people have done to you. I, 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 I don't know the things that you've gone through in life at all. But I know what I've gone through, and I know what people have done to me. And listen to me, as your pastor, I have been, I have been slandered. I have been accused of things I have never did. I have been lied about. I have been threatened. I have all of these things that came at me. But I have a choice. And that choice is this. Am I going to be available to be reconciled to those people that did that to me? I'll say it like this. If you're not willing to be open-hearted and be reconciled, you're not, you're not willing to move forward. It's hard to move forward if 
if that person always keeps you back in the pack. And I, again, I'm going to get into what that looks like and things like that. Because here's the bill. God, nor am I saying you can be a, a mat for people to walk over. That's not reconciliation. Okay? So when, when we have been wrong, again, it's easier to delete them out of our lives than to invite them back into our lives. It's easier to unfriend them to, to befriend them again. And Paul was asking Philemon not to write Onesimus off, but to let him back in. And, and Onesimus, again, he could have stayed on the run, but he chose to go back to make things right. We have a choice whenever it comes to reconciliation, and that is this. I'm either going to open my heart or I'm going to close my heart. I'm going to open my heart to the idea of reconciliation or I'm going to close my heart to it. If, if, if the person that has wronged me comes to me and speaks it, it speak volumes to me. So I had a person, I had a person uh, wrong me and Sherry and my entire family. And one day this person came back and he asked, he asked us to forgive him. I had a choice. Was I going to forgive him or was I not? And you have a choice too. Because listen, when someone comes to you and they're willing to say, I'm sorry, it's my fault, that speaks volumes about that person. And you never know what God is doing in their life and in their heart. Now listen, I'll say that to say this. There are some times that that person will never come to you and say, I'm sorry. That's okay. Nowhere do you ever find in the Bible that it says we are to be reconciled with everyone we have issues with. It does say to do everything in your power to be at peace with everybody, or live at peace with everybody. In order for reconciliation to work, it takes one being open. I need you to hear this. It would take one being open, which would be you, because you're the one that was wronged, and then it takes the other one to be honest. Do you know what reconciliation isn't? I'm sorry for what I did, but really it's their fault. Now we're just playing, now we're just name, or, or blaming people. That's not reconciliation. That's not owning what you did. That, that's still not doing everything that you could be doing to be reconciled. So notice Paul says, I don't want you to do this because I said so. I want you to do this because it is the right and godly thing to do. And we as believers, we should be the first to allow someone who has wronged us to repent and make things right. Imagine, I want you to hear this. Imagine if Jesus did that every time we wronged him. Imagine if Jesus looked at us the way we look at people when they wronged us. Imagine if Jesus looked at us and we went to him and, and, and he just said, you know what, I'm done with you. I'm going to block you out. I'm going to delete you out of my life. Where would you all, where would you and I be? I'll tell you where I would be. I wouldn't be on this platform. I wouldn't be in this church. Because I've done so, I've done so much, even after being a Christian, that I wronged God. Did you know that every time you sin, it's you wronging God? It's you wronging him. It's not you wronging each other. That's but it's you really wronging him. And so just put yourself in that place that where God sick and, and, and every one of us in the room wrong him, don't we? It's called sin. What if he can't call us out of our li- his life the way we can't call other people out of ours? Where would we be? And that's what Paul is trying to get uh, Philemon to see. He, he's trying to say, hey, I, I'm not going to command you to, to receive Oh, nothing back. I want you to do it with an open heart. And in order for us to reconcile with people, we have to have an open heart. But the person that we need to reconcile with, they need to be honest. And they need to own up to what they did. But again, the world acts that way. The world shuts people out. The world says, I'm not going to forgive you. I'm not going to receive you. I'm not going to listen to me. That's not, the way that the, that's not the way that Christianity is supposed to be. Christianity is, is always, I will forgive you because Christ has forgiven me. And I, I'm, again, I'm not saying it's not hard and it doesn't hurt 
I'm not saying any of that. But I'm saying this, it's our job. It's our job to do what Jesus did for us. And that is the second point, write it down. Be willing to forgive. Be willing to forgive. Philemon 115, 17 says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dear to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Paul said, I don't want you to welcome him as a slave. I want you to welcome him as a brother. Because now he's a Christian. And so now he's a brother in Christ. Now he is a, he, he is a brother in Christ. So Paul says, I don't want you to welcome him as a slave. I want you to welcome him as a brother. And that, 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 that's what I'm, I, I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. If, if someone who wronged you becomes a Christian, the Bible says we, couldn't, we could welcome them as a brother or sister in Christ. That, that's what Paul is saying. This would be totally different if, if uh, Philemon welcomed a Christian. Because if Philemon wasn't a Christian, he, wouldn't, he could care less what the Bible says and what God says. And, and, and so here you, have, here you have Paul going, I don't want you to welcome him as a slave. I want you to welcome him as a brother. So what was Paul asking? Paul was asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus. And that's hard. It's hard to forgive people. Is it not? You guys are super quiet today. Come back next week, I'll... I'll yell and scream all over the place like I normally do. But seriously, it's, it's hard to forgive people. Like, it's hard. Until you realize what God is forgiving you for. When we realize what God has forgiven us for, it would be easier to forgive others. Because listen to me, there is nothing on this planet that somebody could do to you that was worse than what we did to Jesus. Think about the cross. Think about the cross. Did you know that every one of you, including me, put Jesus on that cross? I know a lot of us go, well, the Romans did it and the Jews did it. No, 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 no. We all did it because it was voluntary. Nobody made Jesus do that. He did it for you and I. So I want you to think about that. Has anybody put you on a cross? No, you're still living and breathing. But Jesus forgave us while he was on the cross. So it's hard to forgive people, but when we look at what we've been forgiven of, it becomes easier. And we can't, we, I mean, that's just an on our own. We, we need God's help to, we need God's help to uh, forgive people and, and, and all those things. And again, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying any of this is easy. It's hard. It's hard. But, but here, here's what happens when, when we do forgive people. If you're taking up, write this down. Forgiveness means I choose to cancel your debt. Forgiveness means I choose to cancel your debt. Colossians 2, 13 through 14 says, When you were dead in your sins and your uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. I want you to hear this. He forgave us all our sins. How many sins? How many? Having canceled the charge of our legal indebt- indebtedness, we stood against us and condemned us. He has taken away, nailing it to the cross. I want you to think about this. When Jesus went to the cross, when, when Jesus was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that very moment, the entire sin of humanity was poured out on Jesus because God cannot look at sin. He had to turn away from Jesus. At that moment, Jesus felt exactly what we feel when we feel distant from God and when we are carrying the weight of our sin. Jesus took your and and my sin to the cross. 
Forgiveness means I choose to cancel your debt. It means that when you come to me and you ask me to forgive you, I forgive you and I let it go. I cancel your debt. Think about this. How crazy would it be that every time we were walking with the Lord and we prayed and he goes, oh man, do you remember when you did that? Do you remember when you did that? You ever know that Christians are the biggest, the, I'm okay, like a, the Christ, Christians are the biggest, they have the best memory of everyone. I'm trying to say that in a, in a more of a smoother way. We have the best memory. We can remember your sin. And if you give us enough, we'll tell you about your sin. Aren't you glad God doesn't do that? I'm glad God doesn't do that because, my goodness, man, I would have to carry a lot. How many people, I, 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 how many people have, have Jesus forgiven in this room? Now, I want you to think about this. How many sins does he hold against you? If you've given it to Jesus, the answer is zero. If you haven't given it to Jesus, the answer is many. He chose to cancel our debt, not because we were worthy, but because, and, or not because we deserve it, but he canceled it because we act. Listen to me. I want you to hear this. The person that comes to you and says, hey, I know I wronged you. Would you forgive me? They don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't either. We choose to forgive because we were forgiven. We were forgiven. Christianity is based on forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as, Christ, uh, just as in Christ God forgave you. I'm going to ask you a question again. How many of you have been forgiven? If your answer is me, it's your responsibility to forgive other people in the measure that Jesus forgave you. Here's the other flip side. If they never ask you to forgive them, what are you going to do? You still forgive them. You forgive them in your heart. You let it go. And I don't mean that in a get over it kind of way, but you just let it go because here's why. When we choose not to forgive, we stay chained to the past. If we choose not to forgive, we stay chained to the past. We're always remembering what they did, what they did, what they did, what they did, what they did. And you're staying back here and God wants you all the way over here, but you can't get over here because you're standing back here and you're standing in the past. And every time you see that person at Walmart, you remember what they did and you are holding it against them. Or you see them at a restaurant, you're holding it against them. Can I be honest with you? When we forgive people, it has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with us. Like it has everything to do with us. We are chained to the past if every time, we, every time we remember what they did and we're holding on to that sin, we are chained to the past. God did not die so you could live in the past. In Galatians, it says that he died so that you will live free. He wants you to live free. Here's what I know. Forgiven people forgive people. If you've been forgiven... It's our responsibility to forgive others. But here, 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 here's where I want to get into the little, little nitty-gritty of the forgiveness is not minimizing the wrong. It's just choosing not to live there anymore. It's not minimizing the wrong. It's just choosing not to live there anymore. Forgiveness is not forgetting. It's just choosing not to hold it against them. Right? Like, like if, if anyone ever tells you that to forgive and forget, in a nice way, tell them to get over themselves because you can't forgive and forget. Like the only way you're going to forget is if you die or you, you, you get dementia. That's the only way you're forgetting. But you don't have to allow what they did to you to keep you in bondage. You don't have to allow them to keep you in bondage. 
Go, I, I, again, I don't know who have wronged you, but I know that I have, uh, we have been, Jesus has forgiven us of the inexcusable so we can turn around and do the same for others. Write, write this down real quick. Forgiveness gets the prisoner free and discovers that prisoner with me. Forgiveness sets the prisoner free and discovers that prisoner with me. Listen to me. There are too many Christians walking around and they're offended because of what someone did to them. The other person's living their life and you are in prison. You are in prison. I know people that are so bitter. My, I, I know Christians that go to church every Sunday, that lift their hands and worship. They pray, they give, they whatever. And, and on the outside looking in, you would go, man, they're, they're a solid Christian until you get to talk to them. And then all this just venom spills out about what people have done to them and how they're holding the drug. But here, here, here's the deal. How can you tell, how can, how can, and the Bible says, how can you say you love God who you can't see? but you're not loving your brother or sister in Christ who you can't see. How? Like, how can you love someone you've never seen, but you can't love someone that's right in front of you? And, and, and so the forgiveness is just setting you free because you're the prisoner, not the other person. They've lived their life. They went on, they were doing their life. They see you in Walmart, they're like, hey, how you doing? And on the other side, you're like, Aah! Look like you're about to have a brain aneurysm. Your face is all red. You know, you know it's funny because you know what happened. And they're just like living their life, yeah, yeah. And you're like, look at them over there laughing. Blah, 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 blah. You are a bitter, bitter Christian. You are a bitter person. And the only reason I know that is because I have people in my life like that. They say, oh, I love Jesus. I go to church. I, da, 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 and I lift my hands to worship. But man, they see me in Walmart. They ain't liking me very much. And I'm talking about my own family. Like, I have family members that will not talk to me today because I did something that I have no idea what I did. <laughs> say that really quickly but they have something against me and I have no idea what it is. And you know what I gotta do? I gotta love them anyway. And it's hard. It is super hard, but here's what I know. I'm not gonna allow their bitterness to keep me in prison. I'm gonna live my life. I'm gonna live my life and when they ask me to forgive them, I'm gonna forgive them. I'm gonna let them, I'm gonna let them out of their prison too. Jot the clock one down. If you're taking out, don't ask for repayment. This is huge. Don't ask for repayment. Philemon 117, 21 says this. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owed you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do with brother that I may have some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. What was Paul saying? Listen, if, if I, uh, Onesimus has wronged you, and I know he has, don't ask him to pay it back. Charge it to my account. I will pay for it. Listen, Paul was in prison. He wasn't going to see Philemon anymore. He was hoping, of course, but he didn't have any guarantee. What, what was he saying? I want you to take the same grace that I gave you, and I want you to give it to Onesimus. I don't want you to ask for anything back. I don't want, you to, I don't want him to pay you back at all. At, at all. I want you to think about uh, the, the prodigal son, right? If you know the story of prodigal son, he asked his dad for his inheritance. He took off. He went and squandered it, spent it, and then he became broke, and all of his friends were gone. Imagine that. And 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 then he decided, hey, I'm gonna go back home, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell I'm gonna give my dad this cop story, and I'm gonna tell him I wanna become a uh, I wanna become a uh, slave. I'm gonna serve him to pay it back. And if you know the story, the the, the prodigal son came, and the dad was watching from far away, and it says that the dad went running to the son. 
And out of the son was trying to give his dad the bill. His, his dad goes, hey, give him the best jacket in the house. You know who had the best jacket in the house? He did. It was his coat. Hey, give him a ring. You know what that ring signified? Leadership, royalty. I belong. He, he said, hey, put sandals on his feet. You know what sandals meant? He was my son because slaves didn't wear shoes. You're no longer an outcast. You belong to me. You know what his dad could have done? His dad goes, oh, yeah, you can come back. You're going to sleep with the pig or the cow or whatever. You're going to sleep over there. And you're going to work until you pay everything back that I gave you. He could have. But he chose not to. And here's what I want to, I want us to hear. Forgiving someone is never bringing it up to them again. If you bring it up to them, you are making them repay it. Look at the Bible. Can, the Bible can keep no record of wrong. You know what we do? We act like Santa Claus and keep a list. Well, we're checking it off. We're naughty or nice, checking it twice, right? And we're like, do you remember when you did that? Do you remember when you did that? Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you? And that person is once again being condemned and being unforgiven and being happy to go through all of that stuff again. Listen, spouses, you are the, we are the worst at this. We will tell our spouse what they did a year from a, a year ago. Well, do you remember when? And you're like, no, I barely remember what I ate this morning. But we're the worst at it, ain't it? Like it's like we want ammunition to our spouse, and they're supposed to be our they're supposed to be our our our, our partner, not our enemy. But we do that to people too. We, 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 we uh, you know, somebody, they do, and we, we throw it in their face. That's what Paul said. I don't want you to bring it up to him anymore. I don't want you to talk about it. If he owes you any monetary thing, I will pay for it. But just let it be. Cancel his debt. Don't act for repayment. And church, listen to me. If we're going to forgive people, we have to stop making them pay for it. We have to stop making people pay for it. Or it's not forgiveness. It's forgiveness on my turn. That's my forgiveness. Paul wanted Philemon to show Onesimus the same grace that Paul showed him when he shared Jesus with him. When Jesus died for our sins, he put on his account. He was treated the way that we should have been. He was, he was punished the way that we should have been. He was, he was condemned the way that we could have been condemned. Why? Because Jesus said, I will take what belongs to you and put it on me. I will take the price. I will pay the price. Listen to me. That's the gospel that Paul is showing Philemon. He's showing him what the gospel looks like. But what is Paul saying? Paul saying, Philemon, I want you to be reconciled to Onesimus. I want you to forgive him. And I don't want you to make him pay for it. That's what Jesus did for us. He sent his son to reconcile us. He forgave him. And the last time I checked, we have to pay for our sin. No more. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you got to pay for your sin. But if you know Jesus, you don't have to pay for your sin. And so the whole book of Philemon is all about reconciliation all about reconciliation and it's hard but if we realize what Jesus did for us by forgiving us we would be open to reconciliation we would freely forgive and we wouldn't ask for repayment there's something that me and Sherry do in our marriage and we'll, we'll, we celebrate it being together 24 years but we'll celebrate our anniversary in February being married 24 years and, and here's what it is we don't ever bring up the past. We don't hold it over each other's head. We forgive. Do we still remember? Absolutely. Does she still remember all the dumb-headed things I've done in my life 24 years? Oh, yeah. She had a room full of annumists in it. You're going to get great. 
<laughs> she just chooses not to. And I love that about her. And I don't have much to forgive because she don't hardly do anything against me. You know, I'm the one that does everything. But my point is that like we chose a long time ago never to hold things over our head. Have we ever got caught up in going, well, do you remember? Absolutely. But we don't play that game for long because there's no forgiveness in that. There's no, there's no future in that. So here's my point as, as we close. Some of you in this room, you are Philemon. Some of you are Philemon. Somebody has wronged you. Somebody has severely hurt you, severely offended you, severely did something to you. You are Philemon. And I am asking, and the Holy Spirit is asking, that you will be open to reconciliation if reconciliation ever happens. And it, it might not be. It might not be. But here's the thing, even if reconciliation never happens, forgiveness could always happen. Even if they don't ask. Even if they don't come to you and they say, hey, I apologize, I forgive. Listen, the, the person, the person, the people that have wounded me and Sherry in ministry and they have, they have slandered us and all that, we chose to forgive them before they ever said, I'm sorry. Because I didn't want to live in prison anymore. I wanted to be set free. They can live in prison if they want, but I choose not to. Listen to me, forgiveness again, forgiveness isn't about the other person, it's about you and I. It's about me and you being be, me and you being free. That's what forgiveness is about. It's not about the other person. Or your own estimus. And you have wronged somebody. And you know that you should make it right. So there's two four, and there's two people in this room. You're Philemon, somebody has wronged you or you're Onesimus and you've wronged somebody. If you are Onesimus, I encourage you to start praying for God to open a door so that you can make things right. If you are Philemon, I encourage you to forgive that person right here, right now, on the spot, let it go. If they decide to come back into your life, I encourage you to reconcile. Now listen, reconciliation doesn't mean you're going to lunch together. It doesn't mean you're going to be best friends. You might not ever talk to him again. That's okay. That's okay. Listen, there are people that I'm, I've reconciled with because they did some dirty, nasty stuff to me that, listen to me, <laughs> I will never be going to lunch with them. That's okay. Have I forgiven them? Yeah. I just don't want to be around them. That's okay. Forgiveness sets you free. And we have to be free because Jesus died to set us free. So who are you? Are you Philemon? Are you Onesimus? If you are either, God in his word is asking you to do something about it. And maybe that's today, maybe that's a week from now, maybe it's a year from now. You allow God to be God, but you be open to it and willing to allow it to happen. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we can thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you, God, that, that you are a God who, who reconciles us, God. You are a God who, who, who comes in our lives and you reconcile us to you, first of all, God. You forgive us for all of our sins. You take away the penalty of, of sin, Lord. We don't have to go to hell because, God, you came and you rescued us, you saved us, you set us free. But, God, there are times in our lives where we're going to be the, the Philemon, Lord. Somebody's going to wrong us. Somebody's going to do something to us. God, I pray you would open our heart to, to the possibility of reconciliation. And if reconciliation never happens, but, God, we will still be open to forgive that person, to forgive that offense. And, and God, that we will never allow them to pay it back. We won't hold it over their head or, or make them pay for it mentally or any of that, God. We will just let it go. And God, we will just give it to you. We will, we will take what they did to us and we will apply it to your account. And we will realize what you've forgiven us for and how much you have forgiven us. 
And then, God, they're, they're, again, if, we, if, if any of us are all next to us, God, and we've done something, we've wronged somebody, God, I pray you would open our heart, God, that we will make it right. And that, God, that might not happen today, it might not happen next week, but, God, I pray over time, Lord, we will be able to make things right in our lives that we have wronged. And so, Father, I pray, God, that we would walk away from here just knowing that you are a God of reconciliation. And God, if it's possible, I pray that we would be able to be reconciled to the people and the things that, God, we have been unreconciled with or to. And with your head bowed and eyes closed, there, there's another group of people in here that you are Onesimus, but you are the Onesimus before Jesus. You are still running from Christ. You are still in your sin, and you are still going to have to pay the penalty of your sin if you were to die because Jesus' his blood isn't covering you right now. And so you are an Onesimus because you're running from the things of God, but you're in this room on purpose, for a purpose. And here, here's what I believe. You are here not by accident, but by divine appointment. And God has a plan for you, and he wants to forgive you, and he wants to take away your sin. And if that's you, if you say, you know what, I want to ask Jesus into my life. I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm ready to live for my life. I don't want to be Onesimus before Christ. I want to be Onesimus after Christ. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand, and we're going to pray a prayer and, 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 and uh, give you a book afterwards to help you walk with your Christ. Well, I'm three. I'm going to count to three. If that's you, raise your hand high so I can see you. One two, three, if you want to say yes to Jesus, lift your hand up. All right. God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this day. If you raise your hand up, I want you to say this prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come live in my heart. Help me to live for you. Forgive me of all my sin. Help me to be reconciled to the people that I've wronged and help me to forgive the people that have wronged me. Thank you for the cross and thank you for the empty tomb. Help me to live for you today, Jesus. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Let's give it up for people who said yes to Jesus this morning. If you pray that prayer, go to the guest services and Jennifer will meet you there. She'll have a book for you. Um, but again, as we leave, you have to answer the question, are you Philemon or are you Onesimus? Then ask God what, you want, what he wants you to do with this message today. It's a hard message. When I was writing it, it was hard. Because we've all been wronged in here. But if you're a Christian, you've also been forgiven. Let's repay people that forgiveness. We're gonna go back into a worship song. We're gonna worship one more time. And then uh, here's what I want you to do though. I want you to, as you leave, there are two cards out there. I want you to take one, one invite change to life and one act of capacity to change them a day or week. So grab two of these cards and you leave, and let's be the hands and feet of Jesus this week. Love you guys. Have an incredible week, and I will see you again next Sunday.